The other day I was going through some comments on some of my videos and I realized that upon looking at my channel I think a lot of people get the idea that I think old Roblox was better than modern Roblox but that honestly couldn't be further from the truth. My channel is about appreciating the history of Roblox and the aesthetic and values that the once tightly knit Roblox community used to have. What it's not about is trying to pretend that a decades old barely moderated buggy version of Roblox beats the much higher quality and technically stable version that we have now. Playing Roblox in 2008 is a nice thought in our heads and I'm sure many of us have wished we could do that but what you don't realize is that you get bored after about 30 minutes max. We all like dipping our toes into nostalgic classic era games now and again to reminisce and laugh about how buggy and simplistic they are, but we often forget that in 2008 these games were all we had. Buggy and simplistic was Roblox. There'd be no going back to Blocks Fruits or Pet Same X for you, all you could do would be play weird games made out of poorly thrown together bricks, build weird games made out of poorly thrown together bricks, and get called slurs on the forums. But hold on a second. There had to have been some fun to it, right? Otherwise, why would kids have played? Which, if any, games were actually fun? Are there any games from that era that still hold up today? Well, in this video, I'll be answering that question. These are the classic era Roblox games that are still fun to play. Couple of housekeeping things before we proceed. I consider the classic era of Roblox to be from its inception to 2012, and I only included games from that era that are still playable in their original place. No remakes or anything. So if your favorite old game didn't make the list, it probably violated one of those two rules. Terribly sorry. Also, I will be doing that Q&A I mentioned and last video at the end of this video, so if you want to see that, please stick around till the end. Alright, without further ado, let's get started. Let's start by getting one out of the way that you probably already knew is going to be on the list. Practically every Robloxian, young and old, has played this game at some point, and despite it having been created in early 2008 and receiving minimal noticeable updates over the years, it still manages to maintain thousands of concurrent players and shows no signs of dying anytime soon. This is Natural Disaster Survival by Stickmaster Luke. In case you've somehow never played before, the goal of this game is simple. Each round you spawn on a randomly selected map and try to survive a randomly selected natural disaster for two minutes. There are 21 different maps you can play, each one having its own little quirks to it, like moving vehicles, or a functioning rocket, or a camera that takes your mugshot. My favorite one is Rainbow Ride. Something about being on this huge ferris wheel while it crumbles to pieces around me is just super fun to me for some reason. Reminds me of that one scene from that live action Smurfs movie. There are 12 disasters to survive. Flash Flood, where the map floods with toxic acid water that disintegrates everything it touches. Tornado, where a giant tornado comes in and flings things everywhere. Thunderstorm, where random spots get hit with giant bolts of lightning. Fire, where all the blocks catch fire and you can avoid it by just, you know, not touching any of the blocks. Meteor Shower, where giant explosive meteors rain down. Tsunami, where a big wave made out of the same acidic water from Flash Flood sweeps over the map. Blizzard, where the acidic water turns into snow. Sandstorm, which is basically blizzard but not as deadly. Acid Rain, where it rains acid. Volcanic Eruption, where a volcano sprays lava on everyone. Earthquake, where an earthquake happens, and Deadly Virus, which is basically COVID-19 simulator. All in all, it's a really simple concept, but that doesn't stop it from being fun. The randomness is a big aspect to it, I think. You never know what disaster is going to hit what map, and it's fun to risk your life in various ways by staying in different parts of the map and seeing what happens. If any of these disasters were to happen in real life, you'd probably be hunkering down in a boring old basement somewhere, but this game allows you to do whatever you want in these hectic situations, with the only consequence being that you might be out of the game for a minute or two. This, combined with its massive player base that you can compete with, is enough to make natural disasters survive a really fun game, and it'll probably stay that way for a long, long time. In complete contrast to the game we just talked about, let's discuss a game that none of you have probably heard about in a while, Dark 886's Base Wars. This game used to be a titan on Roblox. Although it was created in 2009, it was among the top 5 most visited games on the entire platform, often at number 1, until around mid to late 2015. And it won User's Choice Game of the Year in the 2012 Roblox Game Conference, which was basically RDC but actually fun. At its core, it's pretty much just a simple team-based capture the flag FPS game, similar to Arsenal with its massive range of weapons you can use. However, you can't really get your game to be popular for nearly a decade just by having it be a generic capture the flag game. It needs to have some sort of gimmick, something to make it stand out from the competition. And for base wars, that gimmick is its use of vehicles. Behind both teams' bases is a slew of vehicle spawners that anyone can use at any point in time for completely free. You can spawn anything from an ATV to a tank to a friggin' alien spaceship, and you already know that every one of these things comes attached with guns that you can somehow fire while driving the vehicle at the same time. There are, as far as I can tell, no rules to these vehicles whatsoever. Anywhere that your vehicle can fit into, it can go into. The only catch is that it has a health bar, and if it runs out, it explodes and kills you instantly, but if you jump out before that happens, you can just tap another button and spawn another vehicle from your team's apparently infinite supply. The vehicles are basically just an extension of you that makes you bigger, faster, and able to deal more damage. A legal exploiting package, if you will. The only exception is, of course, the flying vehicles. Those things control like washing machines full of dumbbells, and anyone who tries to tell you differently is lying, change my mind. Any game that allows you to throw vehicle safety to the wind as much as this one is a banger, in my opinion, and it's a shame that it only 
averages around 60 to 100 concurrent users nowadays because this game with a ton of full servers must have been insane. But even with just those 60 to 100 players, the game is still extremely fun and competitive, and I highly recommend playing it sometime. You know what? War seems kinda fun. But being on land, that's boring. Screw gravity, I'd much rather fight a war in the sky, where there's a thousand percent higher chance of me falling tens of thousands of feet to my inevitable death. Thankfully, developer Carbon131 was way ahead of me here with his 2008 classic, Jet Wars. Unlike the other two games we just talked about, Jet Wars is kind of abandoned at this point. It hasn't been updated in four years, which I just realized means 2019, give me a minute to go take my old person pills, and it averages around 10 concurrent users, sometimes even dropping to zero at Roblox's less active hours. The developer's current project is the sequel to this game, Jet Wars 2, which definitely seems like a massive upgrade to the original, but I wouldn't know because that game is actually 100% completely dead. I've been monitoring it for a while and it's never had any players whenever I've looked, but the classic version is still hanging on by a Thread. and even though it can rarely fill up a server anymore, the players that it does still draw are really fun to play with. As you might have been able to tell from the background footage I've been showing, this game is basically Base Wars if the only vehicle that existed in that game was a fighter jet and that fighter jet actually had a competent flight system. As you might have also been able to tell from said footage, I completely suck at it. The jets are incredibly high speed and fun to use, but their one downside is that they don't turn very quickly. As such, it takes skill to approach an opponent and dodge their attacks while precisely locking onto them and firing, skill which I apparently don't have. At one point, when I was playing this just for fun without recording, I asked my fellow jet pilots how they were so good at aiming their weapons, and someone responded that it's because they play a lot of War Thunder, so that probably explains a lot. Yeah, honestly this game pretty much just seems like War Thunder except much more simplistic and worse in every way, so if you've ever wanted that kind of gaming experience, this game is perfect for you. Better play it quick while there's still people left to play it with. Alright, that's enough talk of violence for now, how about we do something more relaxing? How about we make a cake? Now I'm gonna be honest, this entry in the list was supposed to be about a different game. Originally I was gonna talk about about the heavily updated and polished game Make a Cake by The Benster, which I have fond memories of playing from time to time when I was younger. It was created in 2010, but you'd never know that by looking at it nowadays because so much work has been done on it over the years. However, I unfortunately then found out that another reason why you'd never know it was created in 2010 is because it actually only started getting developed in 2015 and released in 2016. So I was kind of bummed about that, but that prompted me to look a bit more in depth into Make a Cake's older brother, Make a Cake and Feed the Giant Noob, which was actually released in 2010. And believe it or not, I actually kind of liked it. You've likely played the sequel, which would pretty much mean you already know how to play this version. You pick up batter, send it through a bunch of stations to make it into a cake, and feed it and or yourself to a giant noob. You can also develop salmonella if you want. It's much simpler than the sequel game, yes, and there's not a whole lot to do in it, but there's just something uniquely charming about this game. From the things the NPCs say, ah, who are you? I like cake. Me too. What's your favorite flavor? Bacon. What's yours? Hot dog. Ew, why would you make your cake meaty? to the hidden little easter eggs like this assassination attempt from the giant noob, to the customization option for the noob, to the game's full embracing of the cakeification glitch where you become an unholy human cake freak of nature hybrid, there's a lot more to occupy your time with than you'd think. I'm sure it gets old after like two play sessions, and like I said before, its sequel is definitely far superior, but I can definitely see the reasons why kids gravitated toward this game back in the day. So next time you're on your way to play Make a Cake, be sure to show this game some love too. You may be surprised at what you find. Okay, relaxation time's over, back to the war zone. We fought wars on land, we fought wars in the sky. Now it's time to take to the seas and also travel back to the 1600s to battle fellow swashbucklers in Wingman 8's 2008 game, Galleon. Like Base Wars, Galleons used to be super popular. According to several archived forum posts, it was the first Roblox game to ever break 1,000 concurrent players in 2009, and it, along with a few other games, has gotten its developer Wingman 8 featured on the Roblox blog several times. Seriously, people went nuts for this game back in the day, it was basically the classic Roblox equivalent of Doors for a while. In fact, it even got promoted on Roblox's official YouTube channel via an old series of theirs called Game Reviews by Maxes. And you know what? They do about as good of a job explaining it as I ever could, and their video is pretty short, so why don't we let the sultry tones of Max's The Roblox Admin take it from here. Galleons, created by Wingman 8, is a multiplayer pirate ship battling game. Teams must drive their ship and shoot cannons at enemy ships. Players may also jump onto the enemy ship and do as they please with swords and guns. With over 5.4 million visits, Galleons is the most visited game in the naval genre. The game is thrilling, especially if players weasel their way onto an enemy ship. But players can use onboard cannons and other explosives to do their dastardly deeds. One player must drive the ship while others fight. The ship is a little slow, but hey, it's all for the realism. 
the game would finish too quickly if the ships were fast. Galleons is an awesome and wildly popular Roblox game. The numbers don't lie. Check it out for yourself and see what I mean. This has been Max Benedict for Game Reviews by Max. Thanks for watching. I never thought I'd hear someone talk about a Roblox game in a voice that I can only describe as if a dramatic movie trailer voice actor ran an ASMR YouTube channel on the side, but here we are. What a time to be alive. For how insanely hyped the game was during its heyday, it's kind of a ghost town now. It's been consistently updated by Wingman, so everything works as it should, but it very frequently has no concurrent users nowadays. Whenever I check in on it, there are usually at least a couple of people playing, but maybe I've just been getting lucky. It's definitely a unique style of game. You don't really see too many team ship battle games in general, much less on Roblox. I played the latest version for a bit and it feels kind of like a version of Doomspire Brick Battle where you can move the towers around the map, which has a whole new dimension to the gameplay. According to Galleons' page on the Roblox Wiki, which is often inaccurate so take this with a grain of salt, the two ships in the game are completely different, which means that there are a bunch of strategies you should be using depending on which ship you're on, which is another clever touch. Simply put, watching from the outside, this game might look simple, but there are a ton of little nuances, strategies, skills, and other things you never have thought to take into account before that makes this a wild, unpredictable, and overall fun game. When there's enough players, at least. Whenever I play a classic Roblox game, I usually like to check in on the developer of the game after I'm done to see what they're doing nowadays, and after I was done playing Galleons, I decided to do exactly that with its developer, Wingman8. By the looks of things, he doesn't seem that active anymore, but I did notice that he has over 108 million plays for this, nearly quintuple that of Galleons, so of course I had to check out his other games. His most popular one is Armored Patrol, with around 68 million visits, which unfortunately is private. There are copies and remasters, of course, but like I said at the beginning of this video, we're not counting those in this list, so that's disappointing. Galleons is his second most popular game with 22 million visits. Those of you keeping track at home might have noticed that this only puts us at around 90 million visits, so where did that remaining 18 mil come from? Well, part of it is from a now private game called Urban Patrol with 5 million visits, but the majority of it comes from this game right here, Checkpoint Racing with 12 million visits. This game seems to be fully and completely abandoned, as it hasn't been updated in 6 years and it rarely ever crests 2 concurrent players if it even gets players at all. Which is a real shame, because this game is friggin' awesome. It's a simple racing game where you have to race through a random track hitting all the checkpoints before you can finish. Your car can actually break apart when it hits walls. This doesn't affect the gameplay in any way, but it's still a nice effect. Additionally, by default, your car auto-accelerates, which means that once you start moving forward, you keep moving forward unless you're holding the brake. There's a manual setting you can apply that removes that functionality, but I didn't realize that existed during my first race, and it became quite a fun challenge to try to stay on the track and not hit any walls without the ability to slow down or move backwards. The game is fun to play on your own, but on the rare occasions when you have other people to race with, it becomes double fun, because now not only do you have to avoid walls, walls and steep edges, you also have to avoid your fellow racers. But honestly, why would you when you can test out the crash fields instead? The only drawback to this game is that unfortunately at some point the random generation of the maps seems to have broken, so every time you create a new server you get the same maps in the same order, and since each map lasts 5 races and races are usually around 3 minutes each, you have to stay on the same map for around 15 minutes at once, so you might start to get bored after a little while. However, if you're the only one racing, which will be the case pretty regularly, you can simply reset just as each race starts and skip through a map super quickly if you find it boring. Like I said in the base world, review, I consider any game that lets you abandon the rules of vehicle safety like this to be extremely fun, so I definitely recommend this one. Screw you, DMV. Skipping three years ahead to 2011, let's dive in, pun intended, to Crazy Blocks' smash hit, Flood Escape. I'm sure you've played this at some point before. It has 551 million visits and was insanely popular for pretty much all of the 2010s, garnering awards, inspiring several fan recreations and reimaginings, one of which ironically gets more concurrent players than Flood Escape itself does now, and even getting an official Roblox event item dedicated to it. The core goal of this game is to stay above the rising water in a series of mini obbies, but there's a high level of strategy and skill that you have to use to do that, along with endless amounts of game modes and maps to implement that skill in. Teamwork, for example, is a very big aspect of this game. A normal flood escape map can't really be completed alone. You need other people to press buttons so you can make it across certain areas of the map in time. Other people are also extremely helpful in the code cracking stage, where you have to guess the correct combination of four red or green buttons necessary to unlock a door twice. Obviously, the more people clicking buttons, the better. There is a single player extreme mode for all you lone wolves out there, but to unlock that, you need to get 10 wins from normal games. So no matter what, you're gonna have to suck it up and work with the other people in your server, at least for a little while. The game hasn't been updated in a year now, and it definitely shows its age. The expected skill level for each difficulty is kind of outdated at this point, the character animations are pretty janky, and the build quality is very old school. You can definitely tell that this is a classic game. And unfortunately, as better obby games have risen in popularity over the past few years, this game has experienced a sharp decline in popularity. Despite that 551 million total visit count, its average concurrent player count hovers around 250 these days. Crazy Blocks' current project is Flood Escape 2, which despite having only been around since 2017, has managed to do almost 
just as well as Flood Escape Classic, pulling in a staggering 497 million visits. It still gets regular updates to this day, and it's much more complex than its older brother, with more game modes, cosmetic improvements, and a much higher difficulty overall. Nevertheless, Flood Escape Classic is still pretty fun, and if you're ever in a nostalgic mood and looking for some chill obbies to play, then it might be the game for you. Okay, I know that at the beginning of this video I said I wasn't going to talk about any remakes or remasters or anything, but this next game is actually a special case. This is Hospital Nightmare 3. It was originally created by Adrian928, but this game, this poor, poor game, has been copied and sequeled to death so much over the years that the average new player would probably never know that. In 2012, someone leaked its place file, and as a result, over the years, this game has blown up over and over again across tens and maybe even hundreds of different accounts thanks to people continuously re-uploading it. If you were to talk to any two random people who remember playing a version of Hospital Nightmare 3 at some point and ask them who the developer of the game was, they'd probably give you two completely different answers every time. The original original version of the game on Adrian928's account was unfortunately replaced placed with another game and then shut down a while ago. But before that, in 2011, he actually re-uploaded the game himself onto an alt account called Block. And that version remains open to this day. Because this version was uploaded during the classic era and is fun, it technically satisfies the requirements I laid out at the beginning of this video, and plus it was re-uploaded by its original developer, so I'm willing to give it a pass on that no remakes rule. So Hospital Nightmare 3 is what I would call a haunted walkthrough game. In it, you follow a clearly defined route through a series of the most goofy jump scares you'll ever see. At one point, you get rushed by this still JPEG image of a clown, at another point you hear a creepy recording of Mary Had a Little Lamb that sounds like it's being piped in through a bootleg iPod from 2008. At another point, you get pushed into this room that looks like what you see after your fifth shot of Witch's Brew. It's basically a Roblox version of those haunted house walkthroughs you pay $20 to go through around Halloween and it's full of actors who chase you around with rubber chainsaws and call you mean names. And I love it! Halloween is my favorite holiday, I'm a total sucker for those haunted walkthroughs. They're really fun to me in an ironic, campy kind of way, and that's how I see this game as well. It's completely unhinged, silly, and not at all scary, but that's exactly why I play it, to revel in how bad it is and take myself back to a simpler time when this might have actually been scary to me. Granted, it is a pretty short game, and there's only one predetermined route that you take, so after only a couple of playthroughs, you'll probably be done with it. But I can guarantee you that if you're like me, you'll be enjoying the heck out of every second of it, so I highly recommend giving it a try. If you finish Hospital Nightmare 3 and are left wanting more campy early 2010s Roblox horror game goodness, another great game to check out is Haunted USA's Bloody Mary 1. Awake and Trapped. Originally, this game was actually first released as just Bloody Mary Awake at the very end of 2011, and it was released at the same time as its sequel game, Bloody Mary Trapped. However, at some point between May of 2012 and the tail end of January of 2013, Bloody Mary Trapped was merged into Bloody Mary Awake's game to create Bloody Mary 1, Awake and Trapped, likely in preparation for the release of an actual sequel game called Bloody Mary 2, Gone. This sequel was unfortunately never released, however, and the games have remained combined to this day, which I feel like is actually for the better because the games just really flow together better as one game, and I feel like if I had to exit the game after the first part to enter the second part, it would spoil the vibe a little bit. This game is very similar to Hospital Nightmare 3. It's another game that I'd call a haunted walkthrough game, where your only objective is to walk down a very clearly defined pathway and get scared by a poorly executed jump scare or low quality creepy image every few seconds. As low as it is, however, the quality of this game is actually a noticeable step up from Hospital Nightmare 3. For one thing, the storyline is a lot more cohesive. After an argument with your brother about some Bloody Mary killings you just heard about on the news, he goes to the bathroom to do the Bloody Mary ritual himself and prove that it's not real. He doesn't return though, so you go looking for him, only to find a scene so gory that it quite possibly might actually get me demonetized, no joke, and then you get sucked through a portal in the mirror to Bloody Mary's secret dimension where she keeps all her victims. You then have to do a lot of walkthrough in order to outrun Bloody Mary and escape her scares, and at the very end, it turns out it was all a dream. Or was it? Behind the couch where you just woke up is this creepy, rusted out version of your house, and through a mirror in there, you find this inescapable dark room full of dismembered, rotting corpses. In the back, a note written in human blood. You read the note, and just as you're about to finish reading and obtain the key to defeating Bloody Mary once and for all, you... you... uh... What do you do here? Well, me from a second ago, therein lies the rub with this game. It's unplayable past a certain point. After you finish reading the note, you're supposed to get knocked unconscious and then click this button that teleports you to the next part of the game. But unfortunately, it seems as though some Roblox update over the seven years this game has gone without updates broke that functionality and the button no longer appears, which means that you can't progress beyond this stage. I still think the game is worth playing just because of that campy silliness factor, but it's something you'll have to keep in mind while you're playing. You won't actually be able to finish. Besides the improved storyline, this game also makes use of a lot more clever 
more game mechanics and functionalities than Hospital Nightmare 3 does. It has multiple riddles for you to solve that I actually got stuck on and had to look up a walkthrough for this game as a result, which I did not think I would need to do at all. And it makes heavy use of teleportation to give the illusion that things are happening in other rooms of the house while you're not looking, which Hospital Nightmare 3 only does once. The jump scares are also a lot more well executed than in Hospital Nightmare 3. This one made me straight up jump during multiple playthroughs and I like the multiple instances of dead bodies being unceremoniously thrown onto the ground as well. Overall, like Hospital Nightmare 3, this game does a great job at capturing that nostalgic cheesy horror feeling, and it's a great way to kill some time, so I highly recommend checking it out. Just don't expect to be able to, you know, actually finish it. It wouldn't be a list of classic games that are still fun to play if it didn't include one of the most well-known classic Roblox games of all time, Shetaletsky's Sword Fight on the Heights 4. And also the original one, but 4 is basically that one but better, so pretty much anything I say about it will just apply to the OG too. Sword fighting is kind of a dead genre in Roblox nowadays. It used to be crazy popular back when the Roblox community was mostly nerds who loved medieval fantasy games and the strategy and skill behind close-range combat, but now that pretty much every young person has a Roblox account, it's been replaced by much more mainstream combat styles, like FPS games and spellcasting RPGs. Sword Fight on the Heights is one of the last remaining vestiges of that bygone era, and let me tell you, it might seem rather simplistic since all you're really doing is clicking your mouse in the general vicinity of your opponent, but there's a whole mess of strategies and skills you need to learn to actually be competent in this game. You need to know the exact right time to dodge attacks and the exact right time to lunge in for them. You need to know how to move around your opponent to catch them off guard. You need to get an idea of the hitbox of your sword, which is much larger than it seems because the default sword gears are pretty janky and broken nowadays. And that's just for regular sword fighting. Sword Fight on the Heights 4 has a whole bunch of extra aspects to it that make it even more challenging. For one thing, there's many different swords you can pick up, all of which have different effects, and if you go up against someone with an insufficient match for their sword, you're pretty much already screwed. There are also a bunch of different power-ups that you can pick up, and learning how to use those in strategic ways greatly increases your chance of success. There's also the fact that the map is absolutely bonkers. It's called Sword Fight on the Heights for a reason. There's a ton of unique levels and areas of the map that you can be on both height and width-wise, and certain areas are a lot more vulnerable to sneak attacks than others. And I haven't even talked about Illumina flying yet. The rich history of this game combined with the many different ways you can play and improve your skills makes it a very interesting and unique gameplay experience. It's lost a lot of its popularity over the years because, like I said before, sword fighting is a dead genre, and also it hasn't been updated in two years, but it still does have a small community remaining. And they're generally pretty cool, except for the explorers that break the map all the time, but we don't talk about them. So yeah, go play it. Another long dead Roblox combat genre is brick battling. Sword fighting is actually technically a subcategory of this genre. In a brick battle game, your one and only objective is to get as many kills or KOs and as few deaths or WOs as possible by making use of Roblox's classic weapon and defense gears. These include sword, slingshot, super ball, trowel, rocket, bomb, and paintball gun. If you thought my description of sword fighting made it sound complicated, you are not prepared for the amount of strategies I could talk about that go into brick battling, but for the sake of conciseness, I'll just let you look at this scroll down of the Roblox wiki article on it and see that there's an absurd amount. As nostalgia for the classic era has increased over the years, brick battling has seen a resurgence in popularity, with several games popping up, most notably a bunch of Doomspire recreations, that feature remastered versions of all the classic weapons. And the reason why they remastered these weapons is because they're all broken now. Yes, unfortunately nearly all of the genuine old brick battling places are now unplayable because the weapons, which need I remind you were created over a decade and a half ago, simply don't function anymore. The rocket doesn't fire, the bomb doesn't drop, the trowel doesn't build anything, the Super Ball doesn't shoot, the slingshot doesn't shoot, the paintball gun doesn't shoot. The only thing left working is the sword, which I'm sure Roblox will also find a way to break one of these days. It's such a shame because brick battling is a really fun hobby with an awesome community to boot, but there are just no genuinely classic brick battle games that I can include on this list because they're all just shells of their former selves nowadays. All except this one. Just like Sword Fight on the Heights 4, anyone who knows anything about classic Roblox games knows Crossroads. It was one of the first games ever created on Roblox, period. It was released on Roblox's official account before non-admin users even had the ability to create multiplayer games, originally as Brick Battle, before shortly thereafter getting renamed to Brick Battle Crossroads, and then just Crossroads. Roblox has a lot of classic games hosted on its official account, but likely as a result of them not seeing maintaining them as a priority, and not wanting to seem unprofessional by linking broken games on their main profile, almost all of them are private now. However, for whatever reason, the one game that they did decide to take care of was Crossroads, giving it sporadic updates until late 2017. I'm sure they made many small changes over the years to keep things functioning properly on the back end, but the most noticeable fix they made were the updated weapons. You can tell by the clean GUI, fluid animation, and the fact that they actually work that these weapons have been heavily modernized, but I think they've done a pretty good job of doing that without taking too much away from the classic old school vibe. Like Sword Fight on the Heights, this game doesn't really get that much traction nowadays, but it does still have a small remaining community that plays it regularly, and that combined with the wide range of weapons to choose from and the interesting map allows this to remain a very fun game to play, even after all these years. 
Eric the Piano Guy's Hole in the Wall is very interesting to me. It's such a simple game. All you do is fit your character through a hole in a wall that comes hurtling at you. You can lie down, sit, dive, or handstand in order to do that, but that's about as complex as it gets. Four buttons. The majority of the time, you're not actually doing anything. You're just waiting for other people to take their turn before you can take yours. It's not even that well built, and there's hardly any gameplay to it at all. It's just a time waster. And yet it's gotten 423 million visits over the years, and I enjoy playing it. I know it's a waste of time, and I understand that it's not improving my skills in any way. In fact, if I were to play it regularly, it would probably do the exact opposite. But the rush of dopamine I get from fitting myself through a new hole and then getting a shiny little badge as a reward just can't be beaten sometimes. Maybe I just have iPad kid brain. Is that it? I mean, I did play an unhealthy amount of Geometry Dash as a kid, but that was on a Samsung tablet. Regardless of why it's so fun, I think this game is a good reminder that games don't necessarily need to be complex to be fun. This game has been out since the very beginning of the 2010s, and it's hardly changed at all aside from some cosmetic upgrades. But it still has a surprisingly large active player base and hundreds of millions of visits. If you ever have some time you want to kill by scratching that part of your brain that gets satisfied by things fitting into other things, this game is for you. So the next game in this list is actually the final one I want to talk about. It was one of the first games I ever played on Roblox, and it was by far my favorite favorite game ever when I was a kid, so there's a lot I have to say about it. But before that, really quick, here's some honorable mentions. These are games that are still very much active today and that I know a lot of people find fun, but I personally don't really enjoy and I didn't really feel comfortable putting them in the main list. It's also an excuse to stop this video from hitting the hour long mark. Catalog Heaven is a game from 2010 by Sky Studios, led by Saranok. In it, you can try on most of the items on the Roblox catalog and go down to an arena to fight with other players using the catalog's wide selection of gears. It was a very novel concept for the early 2010s, and as a result it built up a huge community and has garnered over 244 million total visits. However, now that catalog testing games are a dime a dozen thanks to Roblox's heavy implementation of public APIs, Catalog Heaven is kind of obsolete now. Many items and features in that game, including the ability to save outfits, are locked behind various paywalls, and the game doesn't even give you convenient access to clothing. You have to search it up yourself on the Roblox website and then manually apply it by chatting the link to it. There's just no point in playing this game anymore now that Catalog Avatar Creator is a thing, except for the gear fighting aspect, but even then, much better and less paywall while the gear fighting games are out there. There is a small nostalgic community that does still play this game, which I do understand. After all, nostalgia is what my channel is literally based around, but aside from that nostalgia, the game is pretty much obsolete nowadays. The Gamer 101's 2009 Sword Fighting Tournament is a game that would probably be really fun if not for its sheer lack of activity. Like most of the games on this list, it used to be very popular, garnering 47 million visits over the years, but as the sword fighting genre has slowly died off, this game has seen an even sharper decline in popularity than Sword Fight on the Heights 4. And the thing about this game game is, it kinda needs a consistent player base in order for it to work. See, the way this game works is every round, players on the server are made to duel each other one at a time in a tournament until there's one dueler remaining, and you're meant to guess which dueler will win to get points. You also get points for winning yourself, obviously. However, when there's only like two people to play in these tournaments, they're over very quickly and they're not very fun. I'll bet some people are just happy to be sword fighting and don't care about competition too much, but I really do prefer a larger server when it comes to sword fighting games, and this game just can't support that anymore. Shawn Michaels 2010 Mega Marble Run Pit, aka that one game that every Roblox TikToker uses as background footage in place of subway surfers or slime making tutorials, is just kinda mid to me. Like, it's pretty satisfying to watch your marble roll through the track and make it to the end, but aside from that, there's really nothing to do. You're guaranteed to reach the end every time because there's a giant bull underneath all the tracks to keep you from falling to your death. So there's really no stakes to this game at all, it's pretty much just a screensaver. I know that some people, mostly young kids, are mesmerized by stuff like this and could play it for hours at a time, but as the tough, burly adult man who eats a bowl of nails for breakfast every day that I am, it's not for me. In terms of longevity, Dude One's Work at a Pizza Place is the most successful Roblox game of all time. It started out in 2009, immediately got 100,000 visits just days after its release, and has somehow managed to keep that momentum going after nearly a decade and a half with 4.2 billion visits and 10 to 20,000 concurrent players on average. And I'm gonna be honest here. I don't really like it. True to its name, it's literally just a simulation of working at a pizza place. You can cook pizza, package pizza, deliver pizza, take customers' orders of pizza, basically anything a pizza place worker can do, you can do. It's an accurate simulation of a minimum wage service industry job. Except you're not actually getting paid minimum wage, you're getting paid nothing. Maybe it's just the fact that I've had experience working in a couple of those kinds of jobs in real life, but a game that's basically free child labor simulator isn't exactly my cup of tea. It's the same reason why I don't like cafe or hotel games, it's literally just working. I don't know about you, but one of my favorite parts of games is that they allow you to escape your working life, not relive it in virtual form. I'm being harsh here though, I know. I didn't grow up playing this game or the genre of games that work at a pizza place falls into. <laughs> So 
so I have to remember that nostalgia and charmingness is a key factor here. It is a charming and simple game, so I can definitely see the appeal to it if you're simply looking to unwind with a bit of nostalgia. I don't necessarily think it's deserving of so many concurrent players as the amount it currently gets, but I do understand why it took off in the first place and why people keep coming back to it. Rock on, work at a pizza place, rock on. Now it's time to talk about my favorite childhood game. The one I would spend as much time as I could on. The one that I bought a Game Pass in as soon as I got my first ever Robux. The one that I wanted so badly to make a map for, but never did because Roblox Studio was scary and intimidating to me back then. Virus Devs 2010 Classic Survive the Disasters. This game was everything to me. If you couldn't tell by the title, the objective of this game is to simply survive disasters in a randomly generated map. But unlike the disasters of natural disaster survival, these disasters aren't your ordinary, everyday natural disasters. These disasters are freaking insane. There are close to a hundred different disasters that can happen. I won't list them all here, obviously, but some of my favorites are Shoop de Whoop, where a ginormous blue laser blasts through the center of the map and destroys everything in its path. Shedletsky, where a bunch of evil Shedletskis invade the map and players turn into turkey legs that the Shedletskis try to eat. Exploding Pies, where a bunch of giant exploding pies rain down. Illumina, where a sword spawns in and if someone touches it, it destroys half the map. And Press the Button, where a button spawns in and if someone presses it, anyone not standing in the general vicinity of the button will be instantly killed. It's absolutely bonkers. You never know what's gonna happen and it's super fun to see how long you can last without dying, earn cool badges, and watch the map get destroyed. Or at least, that's how I remembered it. I played it for about 45 minutes in preparation for this video and I'm gonna be honest, while I wouldn't say it was boring, it definitely wasn't as fun as I remember it being. I think part of the reason for that is because I got this thing called the fusion coil that gives you a massive speed and jump boost, that's what I spent that robux on that I mentioned when I first introduced the game, but the disasters were pretty easy to survive and very predictable. I'm not saying I didn't like the game, but if I were to come across it today without ever having played it before, I probably wouldn't last more than 30 minutes to an hour max in there. It's a sad truth of life that as you grow up, your perspective changes drastically, and many things that you once looked up to and found super fun can be pretty disappointing once you take off the rose-colored glasses. It was fun while it lasted, but I just don't think I'll ever feel as excited as I once did about Survive the Disasters. The sequel still slaps, though. It's not a classic game, but I still need to talk about it for a quick second. I kind of lied about Survive the Disasters Classic being my favorite childhood game. It was up there, but my actual favorite, hands down, was Survive the Disasters 2. The amount of upgrades, added features, and overall insanity that it has compared to Classic, it's not even close. Also, I spent like half of one summer grinding to try and get a 100 streak, which was hard enough on normal mode. I don't even want to know what the 830 people who got it on hardcore mode went through. And I finally got it, and it was like the highlight of my summer. And all the secret little Easter eggs and badges you can collect, too, Instant favorite for me. I love this game so much. Alright, so that wraps up this list, but we're not done with the video just yet. You guys submitted a lot of questions for the q and I announced last video, and I got some answers for you. I should note that we did make a thread in my Discord server where people asked some questions also, and we're probably going to do that for any future Q&As or other special things where I want feedback from you guys, so if you want a double chance of being included and stuff like that in the future, be sure to join. It's called Nitrobloxia, and statistically, if you join, you have a 0% chance of dying from cancer. No one who's joined us has had that happen to them so far, and quite frankly, scientists are baffled, so I'd hit that join button if I were you. Anyway, let's begin. How did I first get into Roblox? So back in 2016, I was in sixth grade and I had pretty much never played any video games ever. I was very sheltered growing up. I was only allowed online for like 30 minutes a day. And all my friends weren't that way. They were very into video games and I always felt kind of left out because of that. So one day, my best friend decided to try and ease me into the world of actual video games. And Roblox was kind of the first step to doing that. He showed me Murder Mystery 2, which I didn't exactly fall in love with immediately, but I still found pretty interesting. So on September 16th, 2016, I made my current account. I'm pretty sure he was actually the second person to tell me about Roblox, and another friend told me about it first when I was even younger. And I actually made an account, played Survive the Disasters one time, and then abandoned it forever. I couldn't tell you the username for the life of me though, I'm like 50% sure it contains the phrase head bob, but I've tried hunting it down for a while at this point and nothing's come up, so I'm pretty sure it's gone forever. My current main account though was named NitroCrystal81, because back then I thought that every cool gamer username had to be made out of two cool sounding words and a number, and those were the two coolest words I could come up with apparently. Nitro kinda grew to be what everyone in my online circle knew me as though, so when it came time to change my name, I wanted to keep that word in there. So I settled on Nitro Lord, and that's where we're at today. How did I get into YouTube? So I don't really remember why, but in 8th grade, I started to really want to become rich and famous on Roblox. I didn't know how to develop games, I didn't know how to design clothes, I'm not even sure if I knew Trading Limiteds was a thing back then, but I did have very basic experience with an editing software that I accidentally made my mom spend $70 on. 
long story. So I decided to try YouTube. The channel was going to be a weekly Roblox news channel, talking about all the latest things to happen on Roblox each week and mixing in some interesting facts. I got 100% of the information from my first video from this little sidebar news button that Roblox used to have, pretty much just regurgitated everything on there into video form with my high middle schooler voice and an entirely free model news studio, and called it Row News with Nitro. It got 77 views somehow, and then I never uploaded another episode again because that first upload took way too much effort. I wish I could tell you what I talked about in that video, but I would sooner swan dive into the Grand Canyon than listen to myself when I was that young. Many years later, I kind of just stumbled onto some information about old Roblox hats on the Roblox wiki and immediately fell in love. The old style and interesting ways in which they were created were just super captivating to me, and I fell down a giant rabbit hole and found out a ton of insane stuff about not just old hats, but the history of Roblox in general. I don't have any diagnosis or anything at the moment, but I'm pretty sure I fall somewhere on the autism spectrum, and one of the several reasons for that is because my relationship with Roblox and old Roblox especially has a lot of signs of a massive hyperfixation. When I fell down this rabbit hole, I kept bugging my Roblox friends about it non-stop, telling them all sorts of random facts that I was finding, and I could tell that they were getting a bit sick of it. So I decided to try to come up with an outlet so that I wouldn't keep info dumping on them, and I remembered my old 8 subscriber YouTube channel, and the rest is history. What's my Roblox account password? Well, I actually have several Roblox accounts, and they all have different passwords, so I guess there wouldn't be any harm in telling you one of them. So, uh, here you go. Whoever gets in there first, send me a message or something, and I'll give you a prize. How did I get into trading, and how do you trade? Well, if you're asking me that question, it's a pretty telltale sign that you haven't watched my video where I lost 120,000 Robux due to trading. So I'm probably not the best person to be asking for trading advice. Some of you will recall that in my last video, I talked about how I got scammed out of 50k a few years ago, and the reason I started to go hardcore into trading was so that I could get that back. I watched tutorials from Linkmon99, and William DeGreat to figure out the basics. They explain stuff really well, and they have the limiteds to prove that their methods work, so definitely be sure to check out their channels. Just remember, as I said in the 120,000 Robux video, you need to be a very specific type of person to succeed as a trader. The only way you'll get a deal to benefit you is by convincing another person to enter a deal that doesn't benefit them, and to do that, you'll need to be extremely assertive and persuasive. It's very easy to be taken advantage of and stripped of everything you have while you're in the trading community, and I don't recommend entering it unless you've tried every other possible avenue to get rich. If everyone had what it takes to become a trader, everyone would be millionaires. So just be careful. Will I ever collab with Toasted Cherries? I don't know, but I'd actually really like to do that. If you somehow don't know who Toasted Cherries, aka Maple, is, they're a super entertaining and informative creator who makes videos about much more obscure Roblox topics than I ever could. Like a good chunk of what I know about classic Roblox I learned from them. They're definitely one of my big inspirations, and I don't think my channel would be where it's at today without them, so you should definitely go check them out. I don't know if they watch my videos, but if you are watching this Maple and you do want to collab at some point, feel free to hit me up. Give me money. Uh, okay. What editing software do I use? DaVinci Resolve. It's pretty much the best free editing software you can get. I've heard a lot of people say they tried it and found it too complicated for them, but honestly, I just watched one 30-minute crash course video, and that was all it took for me to be able to make my first video. Also, add all the people who comment on all my old videos that there's only sound in one ear. Don't worry, I'm very aware of that. And it was because I recorded those videos with a random voice recording app on my cheap Android phone that apparently only recorded them in mono and I somehow didn't notice. So no, DaVinci Resolve will not make your audio be only in one ear. I recommend trying it out. How do I get video ideas. This is gonna disappoint you, but nowadays I pretty much just come up with them without trying. It's because whenever I'm not writing or recording or editing, a good chunk of my time is spent just sifting through the Wayback Machine and forum archives following rabbit holes from old users and games I find. In my travels, I'll sometimes come across something particularly insane or interesting, and I'll just be like, oh, that's insane or interesting, I should make a video about that. If you want my advice on how to come up with video ideas yourself, it would probably be to just engage with whatever topic you're planning on making videos on a lot. Take note of anything cool you see while doing it, and try to spin it into a catchy sounding video idea. Do I plan to do only Roblox or will I branch out in the future? Well, as I said before, my current largest hyperfixation is Roblox, and it'll probably be that way for a while. Plus, Roblox is what pulls in the views, so why stop now, you know? Another one of my biggest interests, which sort of stems off of old Roblox, is just general early 2000s, late 90s nostalgia, especially web-based. A good example of that kind of content is Izzy's, who I also really recommend checking out. She makes very well put together informative videos and wears some of the coolest outfits of all time, so I'm sure you guys would enjoy her stuff. What is my favorite color? And finally, will I ever do a face reveal? Are you insane? Do you know how embarrassing that would be? How liable that would make me to ne'er do wells finding out my personal information? There are deep faking programs out there now that can take anyone's face and make it seem like they're doing and saying horrible things. The fact that you would even think to ask me such a question is frankly insulting. Shame on you.
I'd just like to say thank you once again, but this time for 20,000 subscribers. By the time this video is out, we'll probably have hit that milestone, and that's freaking insane. When I was first making this channel, I took a look at a lot of other channels that make videos on old Roblox, and they pretty much all had only a few thousand subscribers each, except Toasted Cherries, so I thought that was pretty much the cap for this niche. But I decided to go into it anyway, and now my recent videos are averaging over 100,000 views each, and we've hit this incredible milestone. I'm incredibly grateful that I was able to bring so many of you into this niche, and the fact that y'all are interested in the stuff I create means more to me than you'll ever know. By the time this video is uploaded, I'll also be done with my first year of college, which means I'll have a lot more time to work on videos for the next few months. I have some really interesting stuff planned, and I'm so glad you're all along for the ride. With that being said, I've been Nitro Lord, and I will see you all next time. Bye!